What is up, fantasy people? This is the True North Fantasy Pod, presented by Monkey Knife Fight. I am Travis Seal, coming live from that secret location within the True North Fantasy Lair, co-hosting and West Coasting with me, Tyrell McLaughlin. How's it going, buddy? It is a pleasure to spend another Wednesday night talking some fantasy football with you, man. Always, always, yeah. Getting, uh, getting pumped for Super Bowl and uh, living the dream. Other than that absolutely absolutely like i said they're presented by monkey knife fight really really love them and thanks for their support promo code tnff for an instant match on your first deposit up to 100 dollars with monkey knife fight so go check it out for some killer player props lots of fun over there and if you want to check out our work uh, it can be found at truenorthffb.com please make sure you subscribe to the tnff network on youtube that's where most of our stuff is. We are doing mostly video content these days, and we have four weekly shows with the entire True North crew, so you can catch all of the voids on the True North, uh, the TNFF network, so make sure you please go subscribe there. And then the socials, we are True North FFB on Twitter and Instagram, Ty, True North Fantasy Football on Facebook, and uh, yeah, that was a mouthful, but please go go check us out there, and let's get connected and start chatting some fantasy football. And, of course, we are proud members of the Fantasy Points Media Group. Uh, It amazes me that some people still haven't heard of FantasyPoints.com. It is by far my favorite resource in the entire fantasy football industry because it's populated by a bunch of guys who are invested as owners along with just a buffet of... A, like a collection of, of elite analysts, just a bunch of people at the top of their field serving niches and giving you the best information, uh, and it's all in one place and that's what i love about fantasypoints.com and after the super bowl we can maybe get into some further detail as to our promo codes and stuff like that but right now they have a wicked early bird special for 2022 subscription so i recommend that everybody rush over pause the podcast even (laughs) yeah and run over and make sure you are subscribed at fantasypoints.com yeah, early bird. Early bird gets the worm there, Ty. Early bird gets the worm. And the media group's doing a ton of good work. We love all the other brands there. And uh, actually, they just had a really nice article that was kind of like um, what they're going to get up to in 2022. And there was a nice little shout out to the media group there as well. And some really killer stuff coming down the pipes for Fantasy Points Media Group. So that's a good start if you want to get hyped up is go check that article out because uh, Ben, our buddy Ben, the director of operations, had a little piece in there. And then John Hansen himself, the, the legend. So uh, really, really great to be a part of that that crew with the Fantasy Points Media Group. Yeah, Ty, so we're going to get into it. This is, uh, I don't even know, episode 122 or something like that. Uh, we've been doing this for a while, basically, is what I'm trying to say there. But tonight, we are going to kind of wrap up our position-by-position position look at the landscape across the NFL. And we're going to talk some tight ends, Ty. So not talking about me specifically, because I um, do have a tight end myself. Um, or so my wife tells me. I think she's just trying to butter me up, though, because I got <laughs> nothing. Um, we're going to talk about some tight ends in the NFL, a very important position for fantasy because recently we have seen some juggernauts at the top of the position who have really provided an advantage for our team. Uh, I know you've dabbled in a little bit of early tight end, tie, and oh, I think uh, we're, yeah, Our podcast has been an elite tight end to start your draft exactly. proponent, I would say. Yeah, yeah or at least kind of top half of the tight end echelon for sure. Uh, and we're going to talk about some of those guys tonight and i think it's going to be pretty fun to unpack because there's uh i think we are seeing some of these young names finally start to see some more consistency is it the year that we see the tight end resurgence this is the year man this is the year Mm -hmm. 
And uh, like I'm with you in episode 122. I'm sure we've also the over under for Tesla's uh, age when he dies, I would say. Yeah. 122. <laughs> 122 yeah. But uh, I, I love talking about the tight end position because I do think there's a bit of a disconnect between the dynasty market and the real world a little bit, which can happen sometimes. Uh, so w- what do you think? Like uh, you, you sounded a little bit optimistic. Like, do you think it is the same old, same old at tight end? Uh, or do you think this is a bit of a changing landscape? at the position yeah i think i think uh for those of uh, those of uh those of our listeners who have listened to at least five of those 122 episodes they probably know that i'm kind of ever the optimist mm-hmm. so i am yeah. staying optimistic for the tight end position a lot of good names a lot of good names that we're going to talk about tonight obviously and we're gonna we're gonna pitter patter pretty quick but i think uh, i think it, we could see that with some of these young quarterbacks, especially that are coming in and kind of taking prominent roles. I think we could see some uh, some surge at the top. We're definitely seeing some churn of, of names at the top, yep. if not Finally. numbers of guys at the top. So um, why don't we dive in a little bit here right at kind of the top of the list, Ty? Maybe not the top of the list for this season, um, but I think this guy is probably the best fantasy tight end we have ever seen, and that would be Travis Kelsey. This year, like I just kind of alluded to, he was the tight end two after five straight seasons as the tight end one. So pretty incredible stuff like we've never even seen before at the tight end position. He uh, he did have the second most targets this year and the second most receptions of all tight ends tied for, for the positional lead with nine touchdowns. But he is getting up there, Ty. He's 32 years old and... Uh, we know that we've seen some elite tight ends kind of put father time to the test, but with that kind of reign of tight end one terror in the past for now, at least uh, where, where does Travis Kelsey settle among dynasty tight ends for you with that age compared to these young guys? And maybe just give us some thoughts on his present and maybe his future. Yeah, I'm still a big proponent of Travis Kelsey. I hope we don't soon forget just because Mark Andrews had such a special season that Travis Kelsey was the tight end one overall in fantasy for five straight seasons before uh, before finishing as the tight end two this year. Uh, sixth straight season with over 80 catches and over 1,000 yards receiving. And it, it really was in 2021 a two-man tier atop the position, and Kelsey was still just an, an amazing asset, right? I mean, he outscored the tight end three by over 60 fantasy points. He had over 100 PPR points more than Dallas Goddard, who was the tight end eight. So a lot of what I talk about with the tight end position is that it's still a very top-heavy one oh, yeah. with a lot of volatility, a lot of injuries and stuff. So I think the advantage uh, was still there. Kelsey was still very much an elite option. I think the week-winning performances show a lot of that. Like, only Andrews and Kelsey had more than six top-five finishes this year, and Kelsey had nine of them. <laughs> and I know, like, the target share dipped a bit in 2021. The air yards per target was down, but I think some of that was more of a team-level thing. Uh, But that's only also in the context of his amazing, outstanding season before that we're comparing it to in 2020. Mm -hmm. And we know the Chiefs had their struggles at times this year. So uh, when it's all said and done, I'm not treating him much differently than I was last offseason. Not to mention the volume was still there. The air yards were still there. The yards after the catch, too. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Kelsey averaged 6.2 yards after the catch per reception this season, a pretty elite number and higher than his career average for folks trying to say that Travis Kelsey is on the decline. I just didn't see that. And, uh, you know, he continues to be one of those guys. Like, I think he played 45% of his snaps in the slot. Over 25% of the time, he's lined up as a legit wide receiver attached to Patrick Mahomes. So make him more of like a – like, he's more of a pseudo wide receiver than he is a tight end. He continues to be. So, yeah, I know the the yards per route run looks kind of concerning. Some of the stats declined in 2021. But the Chiefs sure look like – they're back on track here in the playoffs. And, uh, oh, yeah. you know, you, you add in a lot of context there. Like, Kelsey has the big touchdown upside. And I, I actually think he was a little bit unlucky in terms of high leverage targets this season. Like, Kelsey had uh, a lot less end zone targets than he uh, than he did uh, last. Like, I think he had only four end zone targets. It was three times fewer than he had in 2020. And I expect that to, uh, to shoot back up next season since, uh, like, the biggest draw here is that he does play in the best offense in football, if not one of the best offenses. He's attached to an elite quarterback and an elite play caller, and the chemistry is just off the Richter scale with uh, with both those guys. And the talent is not on the decline. Like, according to PFF, Travis Kelsey set a new career high in force missed tackles. Dude's just better than ever at making motherfuckers miss. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he had over 100 yards, more yards after the catch than any other tight end this season. Yeah, he so did, yeah. I think he's, he's a second-round pick, I would say, in a dynasty startup. I do have Travis Kelsey as my tight end one overall in dynasty. And... 
not being a slave, like, I, you know, I consider it not being a slave to, like, Fair. age that high Fair. up in a draft. I can pair Kelsey with younger tight ends. And uh, a dynasty league that you're actually the commissioner of, now that I think of it, uh, you paired him with, with Mark Andrews a couple years back. So <laughs> it's turned yeah. out pretty good. <laughs> oh, man, my flex was set this season. My flex Flexing was set, flex. and I needed that in that league because I was decimated at the wide receiver position by injury. Almost had the repeat, but I digress. Yeah, I, I like everything you said there, Ty. And I think um, it really depends on your window. I actually have Kyle Pitts as my dynasty tight end one um, for reasons that we're going to get into. But Travis Kelsey as my dynasty tight end two, just because two to three years, he's still going to be putting these elite numbers up. I talked about the young quarterbacks maybe making us have a surge of names come into the elite tier of tight ends. Well, he's going to help like Patrick Mahomes as a young quarterback is just going to help Travis Kelsey maintain being an elite tight end this year. And uh, yeah, I, I just think there is room for improvement in the red zone uh, area. And 22% of the team targets is not anything to shake a stick at still. Um, he hasn't had less than that since his rookie season where he still had 19% of the team targets. So um, he's still up there in volume. And like you said, still up there in talent. So he's still up there in our fantasy dynasty rankings. Um, I'm more curious about the rankings for the next guy here, though, Ty, because he was a tight end one this season, and that would be King Mark of House Andrews, the first of his name and ruler of the fantasy tight end kingdom for 2021. Um, he did that this season, was the only fantasy tight end to go over 300 PPR points and uh, had just a huge, huge year, almost 150 targets, actually over 150 targets, 153, I think he had. Um, it was just massive. Do you like, I'm curious with how the offense shook out I think it was a transformed offense as far as pass attempts, Ty. Absolutely. I averaged 35 pass attempts per game the Baltimore Ravens did. 25 last year as the 32nd team in the league last. And then 27 the year before as also the dead last. Yeah. And so they were top 10 in pass attempts per game this year. But I don't think that was by design, right? I think they had a bunch of injuries at the running back position. Their defense was decimated by injuries, especially in the defensive backfield. So I really think that if uh, if the Ravens get some health, I'm a little bit worried about Mark Andrews' ability to stay up in this elite tier. Uh, but I'm curious to hear what you think because he's definitely one of those guys, like we said, he's got the talent and it's just a matter of whether the opportunity maintains in Baltimore. No, I think I think you touched on a lot of the what I was going to say right off the top there. And it, it does amaze me. Like, I know, blah, 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 one extra game, but just fourth tight end in NFL history to have over 300 exactly. fantasy points in PPR. I think he had over 100 fantasy points more than any other tight end in football not named Travis Kelsey. So what can you say about Marky Mark, eh? Like, uh, you know, a top five season all time. Just yeah. had an extra game played. So the you definitely have to start questioning how did he have this big of a season. I, I grant that you know, J.K. Dobbins, and the, the, they were decimated. You're right, at running back position. Um, and, you know, a big train of thought with Mark Andrews was that he could be limited by the offense he plays in, right? Like, that's what kind of yeah. kept him from ascending in our ranks to that elite level, even though we've definitely been a, a pro Mark Andrews oh, podcast for the years. Time. But Lamar and the Ravens were just so run heavy, but you mentioned that just wasn't the case in 2021. I think this offense did transform a little bit by design by adding Rashad Bateman in the first round and stuff. They, yeah. they signaled a little sure. bit of that. And, you know, going from, like you mentioned, the the attempts and stuff, like they were passing the ball 44% of the time in each of the previous two seasons. That shut up to 57%. Mm -hmm. And that is really going to benefit the pass catchers. And Lamar continues to treat Mark Andrews as his wide receiver one in the passing game. Uh, not to mention Rashad Bateman had a hard time staying healthy and building chemistry with Lamar when he was out there. So the volume was there for Marky Mark as it has been really like, you know, especially from a market share standpoint, mm -hmm. but his command in terms of market share, it shows up even more in the high leverage departments like red zone and end zone targets, air yards and deep ball targets. Mark Andrews led all tight ends this season in basically everything like targets, catches, air yards, receiving yards. He had over 200 more receiving yards than any other tight end, but he had almost 400 more air yards than the next air yardiest tight end in 2021. So, <laughs> air yardiest. And, and looking at some more of these, like Andrews dominated in both departments, like dominated. No tight end had more than 27 red zone targets except Mark Andrews, who had 44 of them when Jason Arnott on the league, and he had almost 10 more red zone receptions than any other tight end. Almost 10 more red zone receptions than any other tight end. And all nine of his touchdowns came on red zone targets, by the way. Eight of them came on targets inside the opponent's end zone. But, you know, 
And, and that's just insane that this guy had about 25% more air yards than any tight end in football, almost 40% more red zone targets than anybody else. Just insane. And uh, thinking about those air yards, like turning my attention to deep ball targets, if I'm looking at uh, like on PFF.com, mm-hmm. Andrew saw 21 deep ball targets, 21 passes that traveled 20 plus yards in the air. Nobody else had more than 15. Only one other tight end uh, had more than five deep ball receptions in 2021. Marky Andy had nine of them. <laughs> So he was just uh, the only tight end to enjoy over one quarter of his team's targets as well. Like it, it really is just a reminder that you know, you look at something like market share and the 27% share of his team's targets were just worth so much more because of that passing uh, yeah. rate that we talked about uh, compared to the previous couple of years. And uh, I think athletic tight end is like a phrase that we'll borrow more than a few times in this episode. I imagine Mm -hmm. talking about tight ends. Mark Andrews is right at the top of that list. In my opinion, he was second in yards after the catch just behind Travis Kelsey. Um, You know, I might also talk about air yards and yards after the catch combined. It's a stat. I really, uh, I really enjoy on, uh, on Rotoviz. and only three tight ends had more than 1250 air yards and yards after the catch combined. No tight end had more than 1560 except Mark Andrews, who had 2,036 air yards and yards after the catch combined. So Some wide receiver shit. This guy could see a dip of some of the high leverage categories like red zone targets, but his and his catch rate from 2021 as well was kind of ridiculous given the average depth of target uh, that Mark Andrews enjoys. So that could creep down as well. Hollywood Brown, Rashad Bateman, both of them could be more involved in 2022, Bateman in particular. But... So long as the Ravens look like a more balanced offense, I would say, uh, I think Mark Andrews remains an elite option at tight end. And he's so young that this doesn't necessarily have to be his career year. And the touchdown total is something we usually point to as a sign of regression or whatever. But in this instance, I think Mark Andrews seems like a legit elite touchdown scorer in the yeah, league. For sure. There's actually only a handful of players in the entire NFL who've had seven plus touchdowns in back to back to back seasons. Now, Mark Andrews, is the only tight end there. So I think I have him as, you know, my tight end three in Dynasty. And I have, like, Kelsey, Pitts, and Mark Andrews all ranked pretty close to one another in overall Dynasty rankings. I think they almost form an elite tier at the at the top of the position yeah i think you're right i got i got them right around the same george kittle does come into that conversation i kind of flip-flop on kittle and mark andrews there because i do think kittle can provide some of that uh some of that efficiency but probably not the otherworldly season like we saw from mark andrews this year um and yeah it's uh it's definitely nice to be somebody who's got mark andrews on their dynasty team and like i just don't think we should necessarily expect that kind of season every year you, you definitely are going to get some spike touchdown games and those double-digit touchdown seasons. But uh, if with a continued progression of Rashad Bateman, especially as another kind of big-bodied target, um, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that we could see a dip. But I think a dip from Mark Andrews still m- maintains him as a top three dynasty tight end. So um, not not big enough dent to, to really disrespect the man. Let's just say that. Um that other name I mentioned there, Ty, was George Kittle, and he had a pretty good season. I think almost like a under the radar season for me, just because it didn't really seem like like he was kind of as in the spotlight as those seasons when he was bursting onto yeah. the scene, becoming everybody's favorite football player. You know what I mean? I think he's kind of settled into that, like right into the back of that elite tier of tight ends. Um, tight end four this year uh, was the same Z's on a per game basis. So tight end four, and we're going to be mentioning a lot more per game basis, obviously, because 17 versus 16 game season. And just really um, quick, sorry to, yeah. uh, to break up there. I might throw a little uh, standalone video out there about hit rates at some point because oh, tight end yes. hit rates are definitely uh, Shit. pretty interesting and it really highlights the the big fat tier that exists but also how separated that elite tier is and george kittle ends up falling in the middle of that you know what i mean especially this year and uh those are the tight ends that sometimes you have to avoid because of how expensive they are but uh totally i uh, i totally blew it giving you some space for those hit rates at the beginning my man but (laughs) excited for that short video nonetheless Well, it's a good one, and uh, like maybe I can go through some of it when we talk about Zach Ertz because he okay. was an example that I really enjoyed because it shows like a guy who could be tight end five, but tight end eleven in points per game, and 
you know, do you want that guy? Are you paying up for that guy? It, it's an interesting conversation for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm excited. Definitely make sure you come in with that stuff because I love uh, I love hearing you wax on the on the hit rate stuff. Um, George Kittle, though, he had a he had a really big stretch. I was saying it was under the radar season. But if you look, he had a really big stretch from weeks nine through 15 mm -hmm. where he was a top 10 tight end six out of those seven weeks. And the tight end won three times in those seven weeks. So um, that's some pretty top tier shit, folks. Absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, he did tank for those folks who had him in the fantasy playoffs. Com <laughs> combined 8.6 points in week 16 and 17 there. So yeah. not great, Bob, but I don't think that's indicative on him as a player. I think um, the the question we have for George Kittle is more so the situation. We know yeah. he's elite talent-wise, but it's a run-heavy offense. We saw Debo Samuel get involved heavily in the pass game as well as in the run game like he has previously so that's a concern and then the continue continued progression that i think we both hope for from brandon Ayuk is george kittle an elite fantasy tight end alongside an elite talent tight end so yeah i mean uh we've talked a lot about the 49ers possibly having two of the best players in the entire league when it comes to what they can do after the catch and debo samuel and george kittle um kittle is tough because he's now missed time in back to back to back seasons, I believe. Yeah. Um, the talent is so undeniable. I mean, Kittle ranked first in fantasy points scored over expectation. So for Kittle, you can take that in multiple ways, that stat right there. Like, yeah, he's talented beyond belief. Yes. But he's also a guy you need to be ultra efficient and to stay healthy, of course. Uh yeah. so Kittle, he he is so efficient because of that yards after the catch that he offers. Like it's really, he's in a different, you know, universe, like not just galaxy. He's in a different universe, this guy. And, uh, I, I just wow. think, especially amongst tight ends, like he, he basically does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, cause the concerns are for me, how run heavy San Francisco is. Right. And, you know, Kittle is a stellar run blocker. And why this is important is because he was lined up as an inline tight end for the second most snaps in all of football. And he had the second most run black uh, run block snaps, according to PFF as well. And his run block grades are just unbelievably good. Every other tight end who is fantasy relevant pales in comparison to what Travis Kells, uh, what uh, George Kittle offers in the run blocking column. And so long story short, George Kittle is asked to run block. A lot and meanwhile a lot of other elite fantasy tight ends that we're going to talk about are playing in the slot most of the time and they're essentially pseudo wide receivers I mean George Kittle is in my opinion the most talented tight end around he's the best tight end in football which makes him a super stud in real life but for fantasy it makes us feel like his yards after the catch ability and athleticism is almost going to waste on a lot of snaps so mm. Again, we come back to efficiency, like the 49ers averaged almost a first down every time they've targeted George Kittle across his entire career. <laughs> like his yards per target is just ridiculously historic. In fact, on all four of his previous, uh, sorry, in his previous four seasons, all four of them ranked top 24 in the record books that go back to 1992. I think they started tracking targets <laughs> um, among all tight ends with 60 plus targets. That's more seasons with 9.7 yards per target or higher than the likes of Gronkowski, Antonio Gates, Vernon Davis, Travis Kelsey, Shannon Sharp, anybody who's anybody who's ever been anybody at the tight end <laughs> position, like historic efficiency when they throw in George Kittle's direction four straight seasons now and it's unprecedented over anybody's entire career let alone doing it in four straight seasons five years into your career so the efficiency the yardage the stunning yards per route run like it, it it's almost all george kittle doing this with his talent like yeah, yeah there's a little bit of scheme here but i mean he's averaged over six yards after the catch per reception every year in the nfl seven and a half yards after the catch per reception during his career but there is a lot of stuff like the whole point for fantasy is that there's a lot of stuff that other tight ends are benefiting from that George Kittle yes. just doesn't really like red zone targets, end zone targets, deep balls, um, all the high leverage stuff that we try to capture or the categories to point to for catalysts for special seasons and fantasy. Usually mm -hmm. uh, George Kittle just never hovers up at the top of those leaderboards and uh he doesn't even see like the same volume as other elite guys like i'm not yeah. sure the same upside exists in terms of volume or touchdowns because of the offense he plays in and because he just helps the run game so much like he's a big part of that run game 
And then you think about the quarterback play, right? Like if San Francisco does go to Trey Lance, they could facilitate an even run heavier scheme in that in that instance. Maybe. So basically, I just don't see Shanahan transitioning this offense anytime soon, at least not in the direction that helps the volume in the passing game. So you really are relying on historic efficiency and, you know, George Kittle staying healthy. But none of that is going to be baked into his cost, I fear. That's my problem. Like, especially yeah. because the guy is such a fucking beauty. We just all love <laughs> yeah. George Kittle, right? Absolutely. Like, we love to love the guys on our fantasy team. So he will be selected very high in every fantasy draft. And I have him ranked, yes, as a top five tight end in Dynasty, no doubt about it. But do I want Kittle in round two or three of a Dynasty startup where I'm passing on high-end elite wide receivers, high-end running backs? Or can I get somebody like TJ Hawkins or yeah. Dallas Goddard multiple rounds later, right? So, uh, like, what do, you, what do you think about that? Do you think he is that guy that you should bet on to be a building block for a dynasty startup team? I'm in the exact same camp with you. I would probably take that slight bump down for a guy who I think, like, for guys like you mentioned, like Dallas Goddard and uh, TJ Hawkinson, who could ascend into the top five in the next few years, as opposed to a guy who, in George Kittle, who seems like he's hovering on the fence of that top five at this point. And I think it's really, like you said, it's really hard to see that situation lightening up for him alongside the missed time and whatnot because Trey Lance comes in and does have that big arm, but he does run the ball more, like you said. And I think Trey Lance, we've talked about it, come, even coming into this season, how we kind of hope for Trey Lance to be a big boost for Brandon Ayuk. So I think if that might be the case, then we might need George Kittle to eat into some of what Debo is doing, um, which is kind of just maintaining the low air yards, um, the low air yard kind of have to do and it that, yourself. That's kind of what I was getting at with Mark Andrews versus George Kittle, right? Is one exactly. guy's used like an elite wide receiver on his team and the other guy is like asked to run block all the time. Yeah. Well, I'm just looking at like air yards, like you kind of like all the stuff that you're mentioning there, Ty. You look at Travis Kelsey and the guy hasn't been under 1,100 or sorry, he hasn't been under 980 air yards in the past like five seasons and uh george kittle had 910 this year and that was his uh or he had 777 sorry and his only season on over 900 was that uh season in 2018 yeah. where he just blew up the league which was the exception to george kittle's rule unfortunately so uh yeah we love him we love watching him but i think he's definitely uh he's he's just a tear down from those guys those yeah, top three agreed. that we mentioned so um yeah, dra draft him if you like because you can have that boom, but it's a little bit sketchy with the price. So I would be I would be hoping for a little bit of a slide before I would be in on some uh, some Georgie. So another guy who is kind of teetering on the edge of elites, Ty, would be Darren Waller. He uh, only played 11 games this season, so he finished as the tight end 17. Um, on a points per game basis, though, he was the tight end 5. So a big target share for Darren Waller, 24% target share, I believe he had. Uh, 93 targets this season, obviously down from that like insane 146 he had last year. Um, so obviously a big hit, but uh, tight end 5 on a per game basis. He still did you right as a fantasy owner, you know what I mean, despite... Mm -hmm. Well, he missed time, right? So what do you what are you gonna do? And and he has Derek Carr as his quarterback. So Maybe what are you also too, gonna yeah. do? So yeah, why don't we unpack that a little bit, Ty? Is uh is Darren Waller kind of falling out of Maybe not necessarily that elite tier, because I think we've just kind of established that that tier is three, but is he kind of falling out of having that as a possibility for him? You know what I mean? Is that still something that's in his realm of possibilities? Yeah, I, I actually really struggle with Waller, so I might just like describe what actually happened this year compared to what happened the year before and then sidestep it until I can throw it back to you to answer that question. Cause <laughs> I, I am struggling with Darren Waller. Like if I'm on the clock, I would have a hard time pinning down his value right now in a startup and yeah, like he didn't uh, he didn't play during the, the, the fantasy season after week 12. At that stage of the season, he was the tight end four overall, but none of that would constitute him as a hit, unfortunately, I don't think. Like the former wide receiver was the tight end two in ADP and a first round pick in tight end yeah. premium leagues. And the, the big theme, I think, of 2021 for him was a diminished ceiling compared to 2020. Waller had over... 25 PPR points in week one this season, but he failed to score 20 fantasy points in any game the rest of the way. A feat he accomplished five different times in 2020. So he's still a guy we want. There's no doubt about it. And, uh, and you know, he still saw lots of juicy, juicy work. The volume was still awesome. I think only Kelsey and Andrews saw more targets 
per game, more catches per game than Darren Waller. I think he had eight and a half targets per game. That's like elite numbers from a tight end. Uh, you just you don't find tight ends who see a quarter of their team's target exactly. share, right? And uh, and Waller has seen 26% of the Raiders' target share over the last two seasons combined, which is the highest mark share of any tight end during that span. So uh, the, the volume, the volume is good. But Waller, and I think, like, you look at some of the other metrics that we're going to talk about, like air yards per game, elite. And uh, I think no tight end saw more than 72 air yards per game this season, except Darren Waller and Mark Andrews, who averaged about 85 air yards per game or more. And only Mark Andrews had more deep ball targets among all tight ends in 2021, according to PFF, despite uh, only playing in 11 games this year for Darren Waller. So, you know, I, I like Waller. He's also a very athletic guy. He has that that skill set that we we really want to chase, and he adds a lot after the catch. In fact, Rotovis, you know, I talked about the air yards and yards after the catch being combined into one pretty number, mm-hmm. and only three tight ends eclipsed 100 air yards and yards after the catch combined this year, and that was Andrews, Kelsey, and Waller. So he, he's really falling into the categories with the elite guys. So I still have Waller as a top five dynasty tight end. No doubt about it. I have Kelsey Andrews and Pitts as my only players ahead of him. I think Kittle and Hawkinson, they form a tier. I think those three guys, in my opinion, that's kind of the way I'm seeing it right now. And that pretty much marks the end of the list of tight ends that I'd be willing to take in the top four or five rounds of a dynasty startup. But I I think the ceiling we saw in 2020 was a bit of an outlier, you know what yeah, I mean? Or it's gone. like, like 2020 was probably his career year, so to speak. And the the biggest reason we saw a dip in in per game production or an absence of 20 point performances this year was Waller scored just two times this year after scoring nine times in in 2020. Mm-hmm. And eight of his nine touchdowns two seasons ago came inside the red zone. Waller led all tight ends with 24 red zone targets in 2020. He followed that up with just nine such targets this season. And so you look at like about 30% of his targets came inside the red zone two years ago. That was down to close closer to to 20% this year. So I think the question comes down to if you think that touchdown ceiling could return, like, do you think he has that spike touchdown season in him to give you that tight end one, two, three, four overall uh, performance? But what do you think with all the turnover there from, you know, a new regime and the new GM and and Josh McDaniels, who is an offensive minded head coach coming in? Uh, but we also are hearing whispers about Derek Carr as we do most off seasons. So. Yeah, well, I think it's interesting because I think Darren Waller could be a guy who we see experience a little bit of a price drop maybe in startups, especially he isn't uh, he isn't young by any means. I think he's like 29 or something like that um, after converting from wide Very receiver, obviously tires, took yeah. pretty little tread, tread on his tires. And I actually now that I think about it, Josh McDaniels has done some nice tight end work. Um And I think with the profile of player that Waller is, yes, to your question, he does have that double digit touchdown season in him at any given season for the next few years, at least. But I do think they would have to scheme that up for him because to your point there, he uh, this year, he only scored just over two fantasy points per game in the red zone. Um, And last year it was four point three as the number three tight end per game as points scored in the red zone. So that's something that uh, fantasypoints.com has that uh, I got pulled up here. And I really like that because that kind of shows you um, how much guys are doing in the red zone from year to year. So in 2020, he uh, he had double what he had in 2021 as far as red zone uh, fantasy points scored per game. Um, and Josh McDaniels can bring that, but I think that spike touchdown season is definitely there. But I think like you mentioned, his career year with 146 targets, that's not there anymore for me. And so I'm not necessarily chasing that. So I kind of need to have that little dip in price for me to be able to get in on Darren Waller with all of that turnover that happens there. We don't know even what the quarterback situation is going to be like. So, um, it could happen, but I would rather kind of take shots on other dudes. And they also lost rugs this year. Like he had, he kind of disappointed, I think, uh, throughout the year a a little bit. And I I think they could prioritize the wide receiver position, uh, during the off season pending Derek Carr's departure. Yeah. whatever and we did see that monster year from the uh, slot substitute teacher hunter renfro as well so that plays a factor as well (laughs) and you know regression from hunter renfro could mean um progression for darren waller as well you never know so josh mcdaniels will uh will be a big factor in that kind of the last guy that we're talking about is on the fence elite tight ends here ty uh, would be kyle pitts and i think uh, we both have him in our top three for dynasty tight ends i actually have him as my dynasty tight end one 
the age, the rookie season that he just had, one of only three tight ends to go over a thousand yards this year, which is pretty awesome because I think there was certain circles where it seemed like uh, people thought he had kind of an underwhelming rookie season, and I think he had stretches. This yeah, right okay, here. that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> Talk um, about a guy who disappointed at his ADP because yeah. of the lack of scoring touchdowns. So. Yeah, totally, one hundred percent. But I think I I still like what he did as far as projecting towards the future, and I think yeah. you do too. And I looking at your guy. dynasty ranks yeah. absolutely so not a knock by any means but why don't you talk about his standing is he a guy that you could see taking that travis kelsey um spot at the back of first rounds in dynasty startups not tight end premium yeah i mean that's basically where he was going you know not not Damn far near. off that in, in 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 last year's uh dynasty startup draft so hopefully that does pay off but i think everything we talk about in fantasy is in relation to what you have to pay to get them right it's a it's a it's a cost thing, and, you know, he finishes the tight end six, but he was the tight end 11 in points per game. Cal Pitts played in every game, and Calvin Ridley was gone, like, for half the season. So, yeah. you know, I, I thought it was a bit of a disappointing season, but it does come down to touchdowns a lot. And why he was a tough pick in fantasy this year is because Pitts was a third-round pick, tight end four in ADP, and that is in tight end premium leagues from the FFPC best ball ADP that I pull from uh, from – August 1st to when the season starts, it's yeah. just hot draft season. And that's ha- my favorite ADP because it's higher stakes players who are, who are, uh, you know, driving that ADP. So rookie tight ends remain risky, even in the most outlier scenarios when it comes to fantasy football. I really, I, I really subscribe to that theory. And I, I think Kyle Pitts uh, didn't even bust that mold. You know what I mean? And, and I think Pitts is a different kind of tight end. Like he's more like a wide receiver, right? Pitts yeah. played in line on less than one third of his snaps. He was lined up as a, in, in the slaughter out wide. Uh, the majority of the time, over 30% of the time he was lined up as a legit wide receiver. So it's no surprise that, yeah, he, he ended up finishing second in air yards amongst tight ends. He had the highest air yards per target among qualified guys. I still, like I said, have Kelsey as my tight end one, even in dynasty. I have Pitts as my tight end two. And, you're right. He very well could be the next Travis Kelsey, even more athletic and more exciting, I think, yeah. in a lot of ways. Unfortunately, he isn't tethered to Patrick Mahomes or Andy Reid. I actually, I hate the situation. Uh, I'll Fair. just say it. Like, Ridley should be back in 2022. If he isn't, the Falcons will certainly address the wide receiver position aggressively. And the Falcons quarterback play is up for debate going forward. I mean, Matt Ryan looks ice at this point, and they're, they're passing <laughs> Put volume. Put him on ice. Isn't, uh, yeah, yeah. And the like that passing volume isn't going to be what we want it to be. Like Arthur Smith, who came from the Titans, they want to be a run first team. So Kyle Pitts could be asked to block more as he gets older and stronger. And uh, I think the quarterback play might only get worse and worse possibly going forward. And all the talent in the world won't overcome situational constraints in fantasy football, in my opinion, like along with the idea that other players having those circumstances that we want that could be the catalyst for a special season is out of Kyle Pitts's control. You know yeah. what I mean? So Kelsey being in a dream situation for fantasy football, uh, like Kyle Pitts, otherworldly talent doesn't change that. So that's why I see uh, just it's going to go back to what I was talking about with Darren Waller, like in a uncertain situation, even more so in Atlanta than the Raiders, in my opinion, it, it all comes down to the touchdowns. And when it's all said and done, like what held Pitts back from a truly unprecedented rookie season for fantasy, it was the touchdowns. And uh, like he scored just one time. That's insane. There's mm-hmm. undoubtedly some positive regression coming in 2022 uh, in the touchdown department, no matter what I think of the situation in Atlanta, like over 20 tight ends or wide receivers this season posted a 1000 yard season those players averaged eight touchdowns and every single one of them had at least four touchdowns except kyle pitts who again scored just one time so Mm -hmm. and if you look at like the lowest touchdown scores though just to like you know make my point a little bit even though building in some positive regression there uh the group in that group you see names like uh dj moore darnell mooney and i think just terry mclaurin but what do those guys have in common? You know, it's it's poor quarterback play. Yeah, that's that's for sure. So yeah, I don't like the situation very much in Atlanta. But you know, taking Kelsey over Pitts in a startup could make some folks scoff, and you 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 know you you probably don't have to. You could probably trade back in that scenario and take you know Kelsey a little bit later than yeah. Pitts. I think Pitts will go ahead of Travis Kelsey in Not every dynasty far. startup, but. You know, it'll just change the trajectory of your team and nobody's going to scoff if you win your league in the first year or two and you're free rolling for for the next half decade. But I, you know, I will shed some light on how special the season was. I don't want to be painted as like a Kyle Pitts hater because I'm so not. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
And I mean, the guy, like, yeah, put up over a thousand yards as a rookie tight end. Um, top 10 fantasy season ever by a rookie tight end. I think it was the fourth most PPR points, uh, an extra game, but still top 10 in points per game. Uh, so keeping that 17 game schedule in mind, like he had 110 targets that made him just the third rookie tight end going back to 1992 to see 90 plus targets as a rookie third most catches by a rookie tight end in NFL history. Kyle Pitts joined Mike Ditka as the only tight end in NFL history to have a thousand yard season as a rookie. So I just think that's so amazing. In fact, no other t- uh, rookie tight end in history uh, even registered 900 receiving yards in uh, in year one. So yeah, the efficiency was was just off the charts. Like the yards per reception, the yards per target was just ridiculous. It was also pretty historic. I think he became just the sixth tight end in NFL history uh, to hit 15 yards per reception on 60 plus catches. So it's it's pretty amazing because the other names that you're looking at in that in that group is like Gronk, uh, George Kittle during his record breaking 2018 season that you cited, Hall of Famer Shannon Sharp 1997. I think that's the end of the list that uh, that did that. So he's He's on a special career arc, but that situation really needs to improve. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's kind of the decision you're making when you're thinking about Kyle Pitts and Travis Kelsey is do I want to win within the next two years or do I want this guy to be that foundational piece after the next two years? You know what I mean? Because I don't know if Kyle Pitts is necessarily going to see that within the next couple. I do think all those points that you made are kind of for me, at least those ones that you just made about the efficiency and those names that he's up alongside with are kind of reasons why I have him over Travis Kelsey, because I think even if he has continued mediocre to shitty quarterback play, I think he could still have some of that efficiency along with more than one touchdown. It's funny. um, You're talking about all those one touchdown names. I'm actually just looking down the ranks of the tight ends to have that low of a touchdown total. And the next guy uh, is Cole Komet with zero at tight end 20. And then you have to go down to tight end 31 and 32 with Dan Arnold and uh, Durham Smythe, both with zero touchdowns. The rest of the the, the tight ends in that top 32 had more than did Kyle Pitts. So I think like even shitty quarterback can lead to maybe a little bit of upward regression in that facet even if we do see him not necessarily come with that thousand yard season again in that otherworldly efficiency that could see a dip with the touchdown so i think he and i think the volume is linear if anything and and then yeah totally i think like I think Arthur Smith can run an offense that has those two guys yeah. eating heavily. I just think a third guy coming in spells trouble. We saw that in, um, we saw some of that in uh, in Tennessee when we saw Johnny Smith and AJ Brown and uh, kind of some inconsistencies there as well with whoever that third target was. So it's going to be interesting to see unfold. But uh, it, needless it to price, say, yeah. he's uh, it's uh, it's definitely price uh, yeah. price driven. He, that that's my whole point is that he's uh, like he's going to be ultra expensive expensive in fantasy and I think the upside the optimism it's going to get baked into his price big time like he'll be drafted under the assumption that he blows the fuck up in 2020 yeah yeah I can get down with it but uh that's not necessarily how I usually play at the top of a startup is going like real tight end early um unless the price is right of course but that's kind of the whole theme there. Ty, we're going to get into another little group of some 2021 tight end standouts. But really, really quickly first, I want to talk about our newest sponsor, and that would be Underdog Fantasy. It's been fun, Ty. I got in on the platform uh, this past week and had a hell of a time. Um, just about turned a $10 bet into 200 mm. <laughs> Actually, I had a five-player um, pick em going on underdog and four of the five hit. And then the last one I needed was Debo Samuel to go over 99 and a half total yards rushing and receiving. He finished with 98 rushing and receiving, but that's how close I was to multiplying $10 by 20 and turning it into a cool 200. And the person who I really felt for actually was my wife because I was keeping her, I was keeping her in the loop on it. We were both sweating it out and I think she already had that $200 spent. (laughs) Um, So I kind of felt for her a little bit in that, in that way. I was devastated myself, but needless to say, it was 
a blast playing on their beautiful platform as well like super easy to navigate and uh, actually Ty to tickle your fancy a little bit their first best ball tournament of 2022 is finally open mm -hmm. and uh, it's called the big board and rookies are included yeah. incoming rookies are included which is a very nice little wrinkle so early in the off season so please go check out underdog uh, one little note for us Canadians as well is that the app will not be on the app store if you go to their uh, go to their website and scroll to the bottom there is kind of an app package that you can download and then it kind of unzips into the app or whatever so that's for all of our canadian listeners check it out that way and the app is very clean once you do that and there's no issues from there on so our promo code is tnff and your first deposit up to 100 will get matched by underdog so drop a hundy they'll match it you'll get a cool two hundy and you might be able to multiply that by 20 times if you uh if you pick them right ty so the game's funner to watch tons of fun and there's like lobbies and contests throughout the week too where you can do three person drafts six person drafts and stuff like that yep. so it's just a ton of fun within minutes you can draft your squads and just lay a little cheddar down and try and multiply it and so i like doing that i like the easy format for myself where you can go in and you can understand what's going on really easy and kind of drop it down there and doing drafts is the funnest thing in the world yeah absolutely keep an eye out for some underdog content coming as well and we're going to do some best ball drafts a way to get an edge like if you're well versed on these rookies not a lot of people are at this stage of the yep. game so get in there and take advantage yeah something we're going to be doing coming up here as well mm -hmm. um just to our listeners just real quick while we're here we might uh we might be taking a couple couple weeks off the pod just to do some planning for true north ty and i've got a lot of stuff kind of down the pipes for true north fantasy football overall and the content that we're doing as a team um, as well as prepping for our guest schedule of the show and stuff so if we do take a couple weeks off we're going to try and hit a couple short vids yep, in there and try and get some, some content out. And... Uh, but we're going to do a lot of planning. So please actually on the video, if you're watching on the video or if you're listening to the audio, hit us on the socials or comment on the video with anything you want to see from us this off season, any guests you want us to have back on any content you want us to cover some deep dives that we want to do. You know that Ty likes to become the research demon from time to time and dive into a bunch of stat stuff. So we're going to be doing a bunch of that. And uh, I know you've said before for the people to just tell you what they want to see and you're down to to dig into it as well so i'm excited for that time T take a little bit of time to breathe get yeah. back on track and that's when i'll probably do some of those short hit rate videos over the next couple of weeks yeah yeah those are a lot of fun you you have way back in the catalog as well on the audio side you have a bunch of intro to best ball stuff which is really good too yep, so if you're I'll diving into the best out. ball format yeah dive in use that promo code at underdog and listen to some of ty's stuff because it's really really good information it's never too early on underdog now Kia. so to dive back into the show sheet here, Ty, we're going to talk about a little group of 2021 tight end standouts. Um, one of my boo things, so to speak, is Dalton Schultz, Ty. Um, I was calling for Dalton Schultz over Blake Jarwin previous to 2021 coming in. Um, and it came to fruition way, way, way more than I had thought it did with Dalton Schultz. I was more along the lines of the Dallas starting tight end will be a tight end one yep. and that Dalton Schultz will probably be the 60 to Blake Jarwin's 40. Um, but Dalton Schultz was way more than 60%. He finished as the tight end three on the season. Um, one of only three tight ends to eclipse 200 PPR points and, uh, just a really good year, really good year. Some spike weeks from Dalton Schultz in that offense. We didn't think he would carve out this much of a share, but 104 targets for the Dallas Cowboys is uh, pretty lucrative among the tight end ranks. So what's your thoughts on Dalton Schultz? Because I'm still like, I like him. I, I like him a lot, especially as the number one tight end for the Dallas Cowboys. But I don't know if I'm ready to kind of anoint him one of these top seven-ish tight ends for my dynasty ranks. But I'm curious to hear what you think. Well, you know, he elicits thoughts of how divisive we are as a society right now. <laughs> and uh, there's something I always think of, and that's that a lot of things can be true at the same time. You know what I mean? And with Dalton Schultz, I definitely have a hard time not attributing his 2021 season to his situation. And we should now state that he is an unrestricted free agent. Good he's, point. He's one of the top free agents at, uh, on the market at the tight end position this offseason. Um, but he is also probably a buy since he won't be paying top five tight end prices even though he's coming off a top five tight end season yeah. so um yeah I, I i just have a hard time because you can't fetch top five tight end prices in like an existing league but he's probably a borderline tight end one in all formats next year 
And, you know, I, I think I'd still take some young names ahead of him, like give me Dawson Knox over Dalton Schultz, I think. Maybe Mike Gasicki, somebody I'd probably still take over uh, over Schultz. Uh, yeah. Noah Fant, maybe Friar Muth, I think I'd probably take over him too. I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, this might all come to – like, what do you think about Dallas this offseason? Like, do you think going into 2022 we're going to think of them a lot like we thought of them going into 2021? Because we do. We were very high on the on the passing game in Dallas. Yeah, well, and I saw a report today that Dallas uh, has a backup plan or something if Kellen Moore were yeah. to become a head coach. So curious to see what that is. That would be a huge red flag for me, and I would say we if don't Kellen expect. Moore leaves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That would I would not be expecting the same, especially the same efficiency and uh, just quality of play calling. They, right? Like, they were I don't the think Dak's situation. In football in- points scored and in yards this year. Yeah. yeah I don't think anybody's situation um, gets better with Calamore leaving necessarily um, so that's definitely a concern I think they're praying to their lucky stars that he stays um, and then I'm totally back in on tight end one for Dallas I would expect the same offense um, and we think that one of those wide receivers is probably going to leave the building as well uh, so I think that opens it up even more for not necessarily an improvement on that tight end volume, but at least the main maintenance of that tight end volume, he can stay right in that hundred target range. Um, so yeah, if all of those things come together for sure, but Kellen Moore leaving would be a huge, huge dent in the armor for me. If, uh, if that was the case. And of course, obviously we don't necessarily know where Dalton Schultz is going to be playing overall, but I think he will go somewhere that's going to give him a starting chance. Yeah. And I look at, I look at my ranks, like I can't get him much higher than tight end nine in my ranking like uh I got Mark 12. Hawkinson, Goddard, you know, and then Knox and those guys. So I, I have him twelfth as well. That's where I have him as my tight end twelve. Um and it, and it's interesting because he finished ninth or better amongst tight ends in targets, catches, yards, air yards, and touchdowns this year, uh, despite ranking thirteenth in Whopper, fifteenth in Racer, and uh tenth in expected fantasy points. So he oh he overperformed even just just via talent. And you know, I hope he stays in Dallas because uh I tweeted out the top ten tight end fantasy finishes in Cowboys history in PPR. Uh, let me run them down really quick here. Jason Witten, Jason Witten, Jason Witten, Jason Witten, Dalton Schultz, Jason Witten, Jason Witten, Jason Witten, Jason Witten. That's very, very nice. Yeah, and uh, very cool, but I think it's it's probably going to end up being the outlier for him, probably. Um, I don't have the landing spots off the top of my noggin, but I don't, like you said, I think Dallas is best case Ontario for him. So, uh, yeah, very, very curious to see what happens with Dalton Schultz. If he prices himself at how he finished this year, I'm probably out to be completely honest, but I don't think that's going to be the case. No. I don't think that's going to be the case at all. So, um, I'm probably, I'm probably down for a little bit of Dalton Schultz, especially if I kind of punt the position a little bit, I think he can probably be one of those guys that returns a little bit of value and just kind of has some stability at the position. The next guy I want to talk about though, Ty is the guy that you alluded to. And I think the reason that he is ahead of Dalton Schultz is the offense that he is attached to. And that would be Dawson Knox. And we saw um, a different Dawson Knox than we expected this Dude, season. We I, we were hating a little, or I was hating for sure a well, little bit coming Daw into the like, season. I thought there was no reason not to get him at his price because, you know, there there was, you know, who was it? Tyler Croft. It wasn't Tyler Croft. It was, uh, there's somebody ahead of him preseason. It's like completely slipping mm, my mind right now. Jacob Hollister. Um, yeah, well, Hollister was there and a lot of people liked Hollister as an athletic guy. I was definitely down on Hollister. Might have been Croft. Uh, you might be right. But anyways, just but, some dude that doesn't matter anymore, I guess. <laughs> you know, definitely played an elite offense. And uh, but my point is that uh, I actually cut Dalton Sh uh, Dalton Schultz in that league that you're the commissioner of. It's a right. smaller bench league, so to make your rookie picks, you have to go down to 15 roster yeah. spots, so it's a little tough. I cut Dalton Schultz. It's amazing to think that he was drafted as like the tight end 20-something or 30-something last year, and I cut him in favor of Dawson Knox. Yeah. So I, I, did, uh, I did like Dawson Knox, and he really outkicked his coverage like both these guys did. I think he was the tight end 30 uh, in ADP. That's like the 20th round in FFPC best ball drafts from last offseason. And yeah, finished tight end 11, tight end 9 in points per game. He was the tight end 3 overall after 5 games behind only Travis Kelsey and Mark Andrews. And uh, he was the tight end 7 from weeks 11 on again. So I, I really liked him. And he led all tight ends with 25 plus catches and fantasy points per touch. So definitely an efficient offense that he plays in. He's just 25 years old. And I get that 
it was a very touchdown driven season. Like he was tied for the most touchdowns by a tight end with nine, despite missing a couple of games. But uh, yeah, like he plays for the bills who led the NFL in red zone trips as a team. And uh, for Dawson Knox, like the, the bills probably pass less and look like, like, cause Brian, like, what do you think happens to this offense when Brian Dable is now gone? Do you think that he's at risk or would you like, I would suggest maybe that, Guys like Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs and the and the wide receivers pending free agency, these guys might have a harder time delivering on their ADP because of how they go about their business, like with the deep passing and some of the stuff we saw with Brian Dable, the multiple wide receiver sets and stuff. So do you think Dawson Knox could be affected as much as the fantasy you know, community might say he's going to be affected post Brian Dable? Yeah, and I think that's a really good, really good point there because I do think Brian Dable is going to be like him leaving is going to have a huge impact on this offense. And I think maybe in thinking about it, Dawson Knox could be a little bit safer on that front. He was the 15th among tight ends with just over a seven yard average depth of target. So it's not like like you said. He's doing it via a ton of air yards. He did get some deep shots, like you said, but uh, definitely not like a double digit average depth of target or anything where that's going to be a huge hindrance for him. And he has been a red zone weapon. We saw some ceiling from him this year. He had five games over 14 PPR points this year after zero last year. So that was great. And I think that can definitely maintain because he does do a lot of it in the red zone, right? He can he can be that guy for Josh Allen. And I think the good thing for the Bills is that Josh Allen has taken this offense enough on his back where I think he can kind of mitigate the loss of Brian Dable a little bit with yeah. just how much he's kind of taken over. They shouldn't over. even try to change too much. Like, I given hope the not. the success Josh Allen's had in these last couple of years. I definitely hope not, right? And they're not, a posi- they're not in a position like, say, um, Atlanta was with Arthur Jones coming in and an aging Matt Ryan where he kind of has to shift it to a run-heavy offense. This team doesn't have to do that. And I think... Sean McDermott's going to be looking for an offensive coordinator who's not going to do that and is going to maintain this offense. So yeah, it's a I, big uh, monitor throughout this offseason. Absolutely. Who's going to call plays in Buffalo, yeah. And I, I think, like, you know, I hope they don't change too, too much, but even if they pass less, even if they look like a less pass-heavy team because of how pass-heavy they looked this year and last year, um, I'm not sure the red zone trips are going to be the biggest victim of that. So I, I, yeah, I kind of like... I like Dawson Knox to be a high touchdown upside guy, I guess, going forward. Plus, Knox is an athletic guy. He excels after the catch, and uh, that's why he's used like almost like a wide receiver, too. Like He played in line under 40% of the time this year, over 62% of the time. Knox lined up out of the slot or mm-hmm. out wide. So, yeah, he's a top 10 tight end in my dynasty rankings, largely because of how young he is, the quarterback play, obviously, and because there are pretty solid tiers at the top of the position. You know what I mean? And, and once you get past like into that back end tight end one range, like there is so much ambiguity and yeah. a lot of matters of preference, so to speak, like in dynasty, there's just so much room to move guys way up your rankings because of age, because of upside, because of situation. Um, and you know, that's why I like getting into hit rates. Cause there really isn't a big fucking difference between the tight end eight and the tight end 14. You know exactly. What I mean? So why not take a shot with some of that upside? Because, uh, these middling tight ends, there's such a tight pocket um, and they really don't score very many, like the margin between their points per game is so small. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I was actually just looking as you were saying that I was in my head thinking that I'm going to say I could easily just interchange my tight ends from like seven through 13 or 14. Uh, so that was uh, that was really well laid out there, Ty. Um, and Dawson Knox is one of those guys who with the talent in the situation in place, maybe more so than some of the other guys in that range, he falls in. He's the tight end 10 in Dynasty for me. And I think that's uh, a nice little spot for him to settle. All right, my man. Should we keep keep her rolling? Talk about uh, for this one. Talk about my boy, and that would be uh, Dallas Goddard of the Philadelphia mm. Eagles. Ty, great season this year. He was a top ten tight end as the tight end eight. Um, you and I were actually kind of talking about this a little bit before the show, and like, I didn't necessarily. Th- 
Like it, it seemed like an under under the radar tight end eight season, you know. I it's and I think it might be a product of kind of the turmoil surrounding Jalen Hurts all year and the fact that they were super run heavy. But he had a pretty decent year, did Dallas Goddard. Um, I'm looking at my rankings here. I have him as my dynasty tight end six. Um, I don't think that's necessarily that bullish because I've maintained for a while, Ty, that this guy is an elite talent among tight ends. I'd put him up there with George Kittle. I think he's got a pretty similar skill set to George Kittle. Um, but I think he's got a bit more prowess in the red zone than does George Kittle. So you just watch Dallas Goddard get a little bit of volume and he's going to put up the yak like George Kittle does. And he's going to give you double digit touchdowns in this offense. But what do you think about Dallas Goddard? Where do you have him sitting among tight ends? And, uh, what's your take on, uh, his, his hopeful progression with still turmoil, turmoil surrounding this offense, which, yeah, Blows. I think like it depends. So if Jalen Hurts is the quarterback, I'm a lot less bullish on Dallas Goddard. For Dynasty, it's a little different, like because we could have him for ten years on our Dynasty roster yeah. and a lot's gonna change, obviously. So he is my tight end seven in Dynasty. It just feels a little high if I'm like drafting uh where he goes in like overall ADP. I feel like I might be passing on some pretty sexy names, unfortunately. He quietly had a sensationally efficient season. And he was like, so he's tight end eight overall. He was the tight end six after Zach Ertz went to uh, the desert. And the talent showed up. You're right. He was fifth in fantasy points scored over expectation uh, among tight ends. And I will say he was a bit boomer bust. Almost 30% of his fantasy points came in just two games against Jets in Washington. And half his touchdowns this year, like you mentioned that he's a touchdown scorer. He sure didn't put that on paper this year. Like half his touchdowns came in that one game against the Jets, which was the only game he scored in from weeks five until the end of the season. Like Goddard scored in just one game after Zach Ertz was traded, which really surprised me. And I know that this that I'm going to say could flip flop in 2022, but Goddard had just two end zone targets all season long on PFF, so which it blew my mind. And there just isn't many end zone targets to go around in this offense under Jalen Hurts. Devontae Smith was the only guy with more than half a dozen, and and he had 11, which, I, you know, that's what I'm saying, could flip-flop between Devontae Smith and, and Goddard. Yeah. But how much room do you have for that touchdown ceiling to go up? And uh, so as, as much as I love the talent, I'm just not sure I want to bank on the level of efficiency that we saw this year when – there's just not that much touchdown upside or touchdown ceiling to kind of fall back on if he was to regress in some of these uh, efficiency metrics. Like, uh, I, I just, I really do feel like he's going to go pretty high in an overall startup. Yeah, yeah, I think like... It's hard to say because I haven't uh, gotten into hashtag startup season as of yet and looked at startup ADPs or anything. But I think like if he's going in that like eighth or ninth round, I think you could probably go in on some da- Dallas Goddard. And I could yeah, see, I'd definitely be drafting him. There. I could see some people fading him kind of probably think lower than we have. That low? Like I, I think he's going more like my fifth, tight end six. But like we said, like people could be sitting there and having like. TJ Hawkinson, Noah Fant over him. Like I, some people might say that Dawson Knox is over him if they're looking at the quarterback situation. Um, Pat Fryermuth had a good year. I don't know if with if people are going to be doing that, but you know Dalton Schultz, Hunter Henry had a bunch of touchdowns. You know what I mean? I could see some people pushing those guys maybe above him just in their minds, and so I could see Dallas Goddard kind of coming down depending on the perception of your league mates, and that's where you got to be a little bit sharp on knowing who you're playing with because you might have to go in on him at the sixth round. It in which case I might be a little bit balking at that. But for the elite ceiling that I think he can provide, even on lesser volume tie, I might still be willing to go into that on that where you might not, which is totally cool. But uh, I think he's one of those few guys past that top tier that can offer you that top tier ceiling. Yeah, I'm definitely just tempering expectations. So long Fair. as Jalen Hurts is the quarterback, they're just Good so point. heavy. And uh, just to shine a light, by the way, on the efficiency that I was referring to with Goddard in 2021, he had 830 yards receiving on just 76 targets. That is an NFL record for as long as targets have been tracked. He's the first tight end to ever hit 800 yards receiving on 80 targets or less. So that's that's pretty incredible. And uh, it's a record that Gronk held before him. So, you know, Very you're good. doing something right. He did all that, by the way, after getting sucker punched into oblivion during the offseason. So if he can avoid that in 2022. Absolutely wheels up maybe well and i think kind of just to to bolster my point he did all that with half a season of zach Ertz in the fold and 
Zach Ertz was taking significant target share as well. So um, I love me some Dallas. But I, I will say that, like, I think the whole Zach Ertz leaving was greatly exaggerated for Dallas Goddard's value. Like, I think this offense just looks so different right now. Like, I kind of think that there's got to be an understanding that he's just not in a great spot right now. Like, the allure before was a team with Carson Wentz that was not only a pass-heavy team, but they were just heaping targets on the tight end position, you know, partly because of tendencies with with, with him. And, uh, you know, we remember Zach Ertz historic 2018 season and we've imagined a scenario with goddard getting the tight end one job but that was just it was such a different offense i think totally and i think if it's going to happen we're going to have to get used to the fact that it's going to be an eagles tight end finishing that high based on efficiency not on volume right he's going to have to have that george kittle 90 target huge yardage and 10 touchdown season for it to happen um but uh i just think that could that could potentially happen even uh even on some lower volume even with some jalen hurts um, next guy has been a bit of a heartthrob tie, Mike, uh, Mike Grease Lightning Gasicki mm-hmm. in Miami. I think he might need a deal. Uh, I think, in Miami. Yeah, I think he would be, yeah, maybe. Um, so yeah, I'll take a peek at that on over the cap there, but, uh, Mike Gasicki, he had uh, a, another pretty solid season turned in for the Miami Dolphins. Typical Mike Gesicki, some spike weeks, some disappearances. That's what you're going to get with Grease Lightning. That's just who he is. Um, Yeah, you kind of got to accept that with Mike Gesicki. But what's your take on him in, in... amongst the ranks because you know i don't think his situation is necessarily conducive to multiple pass catchers getting a bunch of work and being elite options at their position um but w- what's your take on it maybe i'm wrong no you look at that to uh eight like the average depth of target how short how close the line of scrimmage they're throwing the ball and we know a new head coach coming in but what i'm saying is you think that would lend to a tight end benefiting from that but that's just not the case because Mike Gusecki the biggest pseudo tight end. Like he's a wide receiver basically yeah. in terms of usage. Uh, and that's why he is going to be a top five air yards kind of tight end. And Always. See close to 10 air yards per target and stuff. But yeah, I mean, a lot of the work that we would, you know, think would go to the tight end in this offense is going to Jalen Waddle. And yeah. that includes end zone targets and some of the higher leverage categories in that, in that sense. So you know, as much as I like Mike Gesicki, I think he's more of like a back end tight end one in all formats with a lot of upside. But that offense has to like take that big step for yeah. him to really deliver on some of the some of the promises that we and, you know, he's running out of time in terms of career arc. Like he's got to make or break when it comes to like he's going to continue to be a breakout candidate. Yeah. But that's also continuing to be baked into his price, I think. So he's going to be a guy who gets drafted right around where he should again in 2022. Yeah, for sure. I would have him behind that tier of Dallas Goddard um, as much as I love me some Mike Gesicki. Um, unfortunately, he just hasn't become a red zone weapon for how athletic he is. He was outside the top 15 among tight ends in both targets and receptions in the red zone. Only two red zone touchdowns as well. So for such a big athletic guy, you kind of want a little bit more there. Um, and points per game in the red zone, only 1.4, which is uh Really, really, really dumpy, like outside the top 30 among tight ends. Um, Michael Pruitt actually had more red zone points per game than did Mike Grease Lightning Gasicki. So, um, and he, tail two seasons for like he had a good yeah. start to the season and just didn't. And that didn't could come up. Good. That definitely could like come he was up. Tight end 16 from uh, weeks eight on. Yeah. So that's kind of tough to stomach as a guy who you wanted to be cemented in that role. Um, but. Let me just take a quick peek skis at my rankings. I have them as my dynasty tight end nine. So behind the tier of Goddard, Hawkinson, and Fant, I have those three in a tier. Um, And then Mike Kosicki is just a step down right right above Dawson Knox. Just because I think Mike Kosicki's athletic profile, I think, is a step above Dawson Knox's to the point that if he doesn't go back to Miami, I think his athleticism alone could keep him inside that top 10 and having some of those spike seasons. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's fair to say that in a better situation, we haven't seen the best season from Mike Kosicki yet. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he was tight end. Like we saw the ceiling. He was tight end three overall from weeks one to seven. Yeah. Yeah. We like that. Okay. So we are going to talk about some tight end or some uh, unrestricted free agents here, Ty. But first I do want to say uh, thanks to our friends at Trophy Smack. Um, just go over there, use the promo code TNFF. There are links through the site at truenorthffb.com on the homepage. You can get through to Trophy Smack and you can check it out. Our promo code will get you a free championship ring 
on the purchase of a championship belt or trophy. I don't have the belt down in the setup tonight in uh, in the studio here, but uh, it's it's really nice hardware. So go over to Trophy Smack, check it out, get some stuff. You can uh, you know you can talk shit to your league mates with a little bit of gold over your shoulder, and uh, and it's really nice to do so. So check it out, and uh, really appreciate Matt and the team's work over there at Trophy Smack. Woo, we're flying here, buddy. We're flying. We just crossed the buck seven mark, and we're going to run through this little group skis here. Okay, my man? Let's do it. All right. Um, so for the for the unrestricted free agents, uh, the first name on the list is Rob Gronkowski. As Gronk will do, he missed time this season, but he, uh, he was the tight end three on a points per game basis. So that is uh, definitely really nice for those who started Gronk on those right weeks when he was healthy. But with no Brady, might come no Gronk in 2022, Ty. Curious to hear what you think about that. Do you think Gronk's just done without Brady? Or do you think he might come back? Might he go elsewhere too? Because he doesn't really have a tie to Bruce Arians as much as he had the tie to Tom Brady. But let me know what you think real quick, Ty. Yeah, I mean, it's tough because you don't want to be an ageist and stuff like that. But, you know, I think Gronk is good when healthy. And even at this stage of his career with the uncertainty, obviously we're not expecting early career Gronk numbers or anything like that. But he also doesn't cost a first round pick in fantasy drafts anymore. He went in the 11th round this year. He's one of the biggest hits at the tight end position when you consider that he was tight end five in points per game, like you mentioned. And uh, I think, again, he'll go in the double digit rounds, undoubtedly in, in dynasty leagues. So, uh, you know, and, and right the second with Brady gone with the idea that Gronk could just retire too. Maybe this is the time to to throw out an offer for him because he might be de- he might just be dirt cheap right now. Yeah, he probably will be dirt cheap, and but I, I probably wouldn't be going any higher than like a fourth round rookie pick for him just because. I'd rather just kind of dip my toes into uh, into the, the rest of the market that I think is going to be around longer than maybe one season. I love Gronk. I love what he does. He's a lot of fun. But I think even in that situation, you know, the third round rookie pick that you might get as like a deep running back is probably more valuable to a dynasty squad for me just off the chance that they break out. Um, then, then is Rob Gronkowski and the potentially like 12 games he might play for you next season before he retires. So I think he's probably going to end up following Brady into retirement, but interesting one to monitor because the guy has, uh, has been a beast and he was a monster this year. He was a monster beast. He was a, a red zone beast. He was a beast after the catch. Like despite missing five games this season, Gronk ranked top six in average depth of target and air yards amongst all tight ends. And yards after the catch, so he was, you know, making it happen after the catch, which is, I just love watching Gronk work after the catch, and so he, he awesome. was getting juicy work, too, like, he was ranked top seven, if you go, yeah, I think you have to go to top seven amongst all tight ends, in average depth target, air yards, and targets that travel 20 plus yards downfield, and in red zone targets, and in end zone targets, and in yards after the catch, and in yards after the catch per reception, among all tight ends with three plus targets per game. And in clutch Gronk fucking fashion, he was the tight end two overall in fantasy championship week, outscoring even guys like Andrews and Kelsey. Tight end two overall. Mike Kosicki, I think, might have been. Nice. No, I can't remember who was tight end one, but it was uh, it was a funny one in week 17. <laughs> no, I I'll like it. it I like it. Yeah, no, Gronk had a definitely a great resurgence with uh, his old buddy Tim Brady. Um yeah, what else is there to say about Gronk? It's been uh, it's been a great run for him, and like you said, he's just been a fun dude to fucking watch. You know what I mean? Like, I think he was kind of George Kittle before George Kittle was George Kittle, except a lot of people hated on Gronk, where I feel like everybody just loves George Kittle. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it wasn't the system, let's put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. K Ty. So Zach Ertz. Zach Ertz, you brought him up, and I think he is a very interesting case to talk about. I think tonight, Ty, we got a bunch of bounce back candidates listed, but I think we might uh we might pause on those guys. Maybe that's one of the short vids that we'll put out in the next couple weeks here. Uh, but we're gonna talk about uh, the list after Zach Ertz here. But what a rejuvenation in in Arizona with Kyler Murray in that pass heavy heavy, heavy offense. Well, pass heavy ish offense with Cl- Cliff Kingsbury. I think he came in and filled a role that was obviously sorely needed for these guys and kind of became a bit of a safety net for Kyler. So I'm curious to see as he moves into free agency, how highly do you think teams value him? And then do you think he's a guy that like Like, do you think he's going to be someone who challenges for top 10 in fantasy if he's maybe not necessarily in the absolute ideal position? You know what I mean? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's tough because I'm not like a huge Zach Ertz fan at this stage of his I career, know. really. But, uh, you know, you also have to consider what he did this year was pretty impressive. And, uh, you know, the thing is, he finished much lower in points per game than he did in uh, in actual fantasy. Like he was a top five tight end, but it kind of just, you know, highlights the volatility, the tears that the drop off at the position a lot of stuff just gets encapsulated by Zach Ertz 2021 season uh I think that's why I kind of want to use him to to highlight some hit rates and stuff but um well I'll, I'll just save that because we're already over an hour and stuff and and you know it, it, it I just think it's weird because Ertz was a high floor play in 2021 like that's the way to describe Zach Ertz 2021 season he only clipped 16 PPR points one time this this year uh, against the Seahawks and that one game accounted for for almost 20 percent of his fantasy points I think and uh, it, it, that marks Zach Ertz being over 16 PPR points in fantasy just one time in the last 29 games so I think there's a you're right like there's an argument to make for Ertz returning to some former form of some sort yeah um Chino no <laughs> We got uh, we've had cats in the fantasy layer before. We got dogs in the fantasy layer yeah. today, folks. If you're watching the video, you saw me get up twice just now, letting one of them out for a piss. Now the other one's got some jingle bell toy. It's a shit show here in the fantasy layer, folks. But thanks for sticking around with us. And I think I think the point for Zach Ertz <laughs> is that he was like it's not the same old Zach Ertz. Like from 2015 to 2019, he was averaging about eight and a half targets per game over the last two seasons. That's down to six and a half targets per game, and he's averaging under nine PPR points per game now in the last two seasons. After averaging over 14 points per game over that previous half decade uh, before 2020, which was only behind Travis Kelsey during that span, so there's you know an argument to make that you you're you could buy Zach Ertz you know what I mean because oh, yeah. he is still possibly going to return to Arizona and give you a little bit of upside but I guess uh you're not going to get too much like he's going to die on your roster if you do that yeah 100 percent, definitely one of those guys who is going to stay on your roster and die um sorry I can't keep it together with these dogs here um I definitely like the sentiment there, Ty, when you're talking about that you could go out and buy him because very one of the very few guys who's going to be kind of age discounted with that kind of the kind of foggy perception around him as not somebody who gives you like an elite skill set. You know what I mean? Like he doesn't really separate very well. He's he's kind of clutch hands, target volume type guy. He's not going to give you any after the catch moxie like is uh, like is George Kittle or if Zach Ertz is going to try and give you any after the catch moxie, it's going to be kind of awkward and like sit down, bud, because you just uh, had a catch and fell down and didn't do anything crazy, but definitely has been been a very clutch uh clutch hands guy previously um came in clutch for my eagles that's for sure had those big seasons but i think if he goes anywhere he is going to need to get by on volume unlike dallas goddard he's not one of those guys who's going to give you 75 targets and a tight end one season he needs that 100 plus targets to be able to do that and especially the red zone work he needs to be a factor in the red zone work for whatever team brings him on or else uh or else he's get, he's going to be a really tough guy to be putting in your starting lineups because he's going to be disappointing more often than not i think yeah and i i think like it's we're talking about ageism and stuff and I'm not holding age against guys like Travis Kelsey and even at cost, not against someone like Gronkowski at this stage, but um, I am kind of against Zach Ertz holding that against him. Uh, I just think it's, it's so much more noticeable because he's never been a guy who adds a lot after the catch, despite his athletic uh, profile or whatever. Mm -hmm. And over the past two seasons, Ertz is averaging barely 15 yards after the catch per game, which, you know, doesn't even rank top 20 amongst tight ends during that span. Meanwhile, Travis Kelsey is averaging about 40 Yards after the catch yeah. per game, the most in football among. And I wonder what Ertz's band. targets per game is on that too. He's probably like six or seven, which is not very good because yeah, he's just averaging six and a half targets per game over the last yeah. year. So it, Three, that's, yeah, and that's all to say that you know Ertz turns thirty two during the two thousand twenty two season, and uh, that does significantly factor into my valuation of him in in dynasty. Yeah, no, I'm totally with you. Like he's probably taking a peek. He's outside of my like top. 15 ish well and i i get it right like i understand ends. i understand that like age could be baked into his price especially in dynasty i also expect uh, you know except that 
value versus what a tight end can provide for a fantasy lineup, it can get lost in translation sometimes in, in the dynasty market. You know what I mean? Even in, especially in like fantasy dynasty rankings, you know what I mean? And I, I have guys like Cole Komet comfortably ahead of yeah. him who didn't score a touchdown this year. Apparently <laughs> yeah. I think I have guys like uh, Adam Troutman ahead Same. of him. First time free agents like uh, David and Joker or Evan Ingram. I might even rank like Johnny Smith ahead of him. A-OK. I, yeah. So I think it uh, it comes down. Yeah, A-OK, I think I would. Yeah, uh, I, I think it comes down to like what you're doing with your team at that stage of your draft. Like, are you yeah. going to be a competitive team or are you doing productive struggle or whatever? That's just it. Because if you're getting Zach Ertz, the best you're hoping for is kind of passable in your starting tight end slot. Um, whereas one of those other guys, you're taking your lumps for a couple seasons for the ceiling that they can provide that Zach Ertz just isn't going to give you. So yeah, I really like that. I think another guy, Ty, uh, who is a free agent this season, um, who could give you more ceiling, certainly than what we've seen from him and potentially more than what we've seen from Zach Ertz is uh, OJ Howard tie. Mm. We were expecting that big season with Jameis a couple years ago. Didn't really come to fruition for him. Obviously he got buried on the depth chart with Gronk coming to Tampa Bay and Cameron Brait being uh, being one of uh, one of Tom Brady's boys, apparently. Um, so I know you're probably excited for it. I'm excited about OJ Howard and the possibility of him kind of getting free here. What's uh, what's your take there? Yeah, I mean, that's the point, right? Is a guy like OJ Howard at this stage can only increase in value when you think of a dynasty market because he's going to get a bump once he signs somewhere or maybe he's back in Tampa Bay and Chris Godwin is elsewhere. For, uh, I don't know. Yeah. but uh, And Gronk is retired uh, or whatever. Um, so I, I like OJ Howard and I'll, you know, unfortunately his best catch over the last few years is at a baseball game, but still <laughs> big OJ Howard fan. <laughs> yeah, no, hundred percent. I think he's got all the tools you want, right. As one of those kind of later breakout tight ends. Send and... him to San Francisco to block. Oh mama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. It's just That's that. funny. Yeah. Kittle's so good. He's not, never not going to block even if OJ Howard was there. Mm-hmm. But I think, yeah, OJ Howard definitely is a guy who, if you're going to go and acquire him, you better do it now. You better do it now and hope that that person isn't kind of sharp and hoping that they see that good landing spot because OJ Howard definitely could be yeah, like that I have, dude. I have him ahead of like Robert Tanyan, uh, Gerald Everett. Like I, I still am showing a little bit of love to OJ Howard in my dynasty rankings, I guess. So yeah, I have him uh, right in there. Maybe take another look at that. I have him right in there. I have him behind Tanyan. But no I, there's, Fox, that's called, I could range. change that. But yeah, he's just kind of like mid twenties for me is OJ Howard and a couple guys who are like fairly near that area as well. Actually, um, higher for me would be David Njoku and Evan Ingram. I've yeah. got David Njoku as my dynasty tight end 15 tie. I'm very hopeful for him. I love the athletic profile. He gave us a lot for the Browns this season that we didn't necessarily expect. Like I thought he was going to be a bit of a sleeper tight end, but he was pretty solid for rosters. He got me through a couple of pinches at the tight end position this season. And then Evan Ingram, like we obviously love the athleticism talked about Kyle Pitts, historic season. Evan Ingram Ingram also had a really, really great rookie season, but it sucks because he's like four to five years into his career and we're, we're still hearkening back to that rookie season and he plays such a so niche like, position like these pseudo tight like he's a wide receiver basically and uh he doesn't really add much uh, in, other than that yeah yeah and so like first off out of those two evan ingram david and joku who are you taking maybe pepper ojh in there too yeah, I think like for if I'm an NFL GM, I think I would take David Njoku at the top of the list there. And yeah. I, I think I actually have him ranked ahead of uh, like just ahead. They're definitely in the same tier for me right now, Evan Ingram and David Njoku and their landing spots yeah. or what whatever transpires with these guys will uh, drive where I rank them from here on. But yeah, I, I'm probably still taking some established guys like, you know, Hunter Henry or, you know, guys like that. I'm probably still taking ahead of them. Mm -hmm. And maybe a guy like Cole Komet who has some upside, maybe Jimmy Graham finally does. Irv? But uh, no, I've, I think I have Irv Smith just below those guys. I don't know why okay. I hate Irv Smith so much. I just do. I am just above those guys, but I, I always question that because I don't hate Irv Smith, but I'm very skeptical. Irv Smith continues to like impress me. I was like not a huge Irv Smith fan coming out and, uh, you know, we'll see what happens in Minnesota, obviously, with that Minnesota. Uh, a new offense, uh, so to speak. But I'm sure they still look like a very run-heavy team with uh, a lot of flood concepts and play-action heavy. So I'm not sure how much that benefits Irv Smith when you look at Justin Jefferson and you look at uh, Adam Thielen in the red zone, eating up a lot of that market share. Yeah. So Irv Smith is going to again, in my opinion, be overdrafted in, in Dynasty. Yeah, Dynamics. 
He's got to carve out a role that we saw KJ Osborne kind of surprisingly take this season. You know what I mean? And I don't know if Irv can necessarily do that because KJ Osborne looked pretty fucking good. And even if he hits, he'll look like Zach Ertz did this year. Like it'll be a high yeah. floor play. It won't be like a, a big ceiling play good for point. for Irv Smith. In my I opinion. like that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna lay out a group tie. Pick out your favorite guy for the sake of time and talk about him. Okay, uh, Jared Cook, Mo Ali Cox. Gerald Everett and Robert Tanyan, all free agents going. So yeah, who are you most guys. interested in going and tossing like a third round dynasty rookie pick for? Hmm, none of them. Maybe a fourth. Yeah, yeah none of them. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, Jared Cook maybe would be for a contender, the guy you, you could go get for really cheap. Yes, he's really old, but uh, he continues to do Jared Cook things. He can put up uh, an efficient season in terms of yards per target and stuff like that. He yeah. can also score touchdowns. So Jared Cook continues to defy the decline. And uh, other than that, I think Mo Alley Cox is somebody I'm definitely keeping my I, eye I was on. Hoping you know, you'd I'm like, yeah, you, you know, love, I love you some Mo Alley. Love me some Mo Alley. Spare me the jokes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I know you're a big fan of Gerald Everett. I, I am too. Yeah. 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 I love some Gerald Everett. And I think Tonyan could settle into like best that we hope for is kind of the Hunter Henry type deal, I think, because I think there's going to be a lot of change for him. And I think. What happened for a couple a couple years ago for for Bobby Tuns was best case Ontario Ontario and I don't think that's happened again. I think it's Gerald Everett is the guy who I'm most excited about. But that being said, like I was really excited about him going into Seattle, which seemed like a really good situation as well. So I'm curious to see where it is as to my level of interest in Jerry Everett. But I like what you said about Gerald or Jared Cook as the guy who's continuing to do Jared Cook things. But I think like he's a guy who I probably wouldn't necessarily be touching with a 10 foot pole just because he seems to change teams every year. Um, Lucky for him, he goes to fairly decent situations, but for some reason, he's just kind of always been a guy that I didn't want to die on my roster. So that's where I'm sitting on Jared, uh, Jared Cook. Um, The last two guys here, Hayden Hurst and Anthony Ferkser. Anthony Ferkser, I had a little bit of hopes for coming into the season with that Tennessee Titans offense where, yeah, they had Julio Jones and A.J. Brown, but I thought there was a little bit of room for a third guy, especially a tight end, because it doesn't take much for a guy to become a top 10 tight end. I thought Ferkser could be one of those guys. Big womp womp on that front for Ferkser. And then Hayden Hurst, you know, first round pedigree, first round talent, um, is a free agent after getting usurped by Kyle Pitts. Uh, I think he could definitely be one of those guys who turns in a back end top 12 season in the right situation. Um, but I think I would go him over Ferkser. But Ty, what do you think about Hayden Hurst and Anthony Ferkser as we kind of wrap up tonight's epi? I think I'd take, uh, I guess I'd take Hayden Hurst. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, but exactly. Like, I guess, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's all she wrote for tonight, Ty. I think that was a nice little, uh, nice little way to encompass the tight ends. We've got a group of ba- bounce back count candidates that we were really excited to talk about. Fryermuth, Hawkinson, Fant, Logan Thomas, some more Irv, Johnu, and Troutman. But I think like with the amount of time that we would spend on them on this episode, we're not really going to do them justice. So I think it kind of makes sense for us to maybe push that off into the off season when some of these situations shake out a little bit more, or maybe we put out another little short video in the next week or so, Ty. So stay tuned for that because there is a lot to unravel. That's kind of the key theme on this uh positional kind of landscape check-in that we're doing ty is that we have more content than we have time for so we're excited to keep putting that together and that's kind of part of why we're we're going to take a couple weeks off here and do some of that planning so really really appreciate that make sure you hit us on the show socials and check out check out the other shows on the tnff network go to youtube search tnff network and you'll find us make sure you hit that smash in fact that subscribe button And then truenorthffb.com to see any of the written work and all the other stuff that we got going on there. Thanks again to all the sponsors. We got Trophy Smack, Monkey Knife Fight, Underdog. Go check out our friends at Viridian Global, viridianglobal.com, and our stuff through the site at truenorthffb.com. I think I got her dialed in there, Ty, but that's a lot of yakking. So you got any uh, parting shots for the people here? No. Who let the dogs out? Yeah, who? Oh, 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 let the, okay. Um, until, uh, until a couple weeks from now, hope you guys enjoy the Super Bowl. It's going to be really fun. I mean, if you're into that sort of thing, you can definitely watch the Pro Bowl, but uh, that's <laughs> totally up to you. It's uh, got to be some props. Uh, 
going to be some prop bets there you can make. There probably will be, yeah. So uh, make sure you sign up for for that underdog and check out to see if there are any as well as Monkey Knife Fight because those are our uh, kind of DFS and player prop partners. So until next week, we really appreciate the love and uh, peace. <laughs>